stone did not receive him. That's really the introduction. That sets the stage for the text that we're looking at this morning. His own did not receive him. And I can't help but thinking that when Jesus, or excuse me, when John was saying that, he would also be saying that to us. That there is a danger that, because aren't we God's children? I think most of you have made some kind of personal commitment to Jesus Christ. You've said yes to him being a part of your life. You've chosen to believe that he is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. You believe he died and rose from the dead. You may not understand how he's God, but you've chosen to believe it. You may not comprehend how he could have created the heavens and the earth, but you believe his word has said that, and so you believe there's truth there. And you've decided to have faith. And yet still... I am concerned that we also, his own, might not receive him. But the good news is what happens next. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we, his children, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Can you imagine going to your Christmas party, Kim? The whole family's there, because you're obviously the only one who's going to have presents. Okay. Whole family's there, presents all wrapped and beautifully prepared, sitting there. You have this great meal, you enjoy one another, and then you all leave and leave the presents unwrapped. Can you imagine having a Christmas celebration like that? Where the presents are there, you even see them, and, and wow, aren't they beautiful? Oh, I wonder what's in that box. Uh, I wonder what that big one is, or what that little tiny one is over there. And, and then just, okay, well, wasn't it wonderful to be together? Merry Christmas! And you all leave? Because that's, that's exactly what John is describing. They came to Christmas and they missed it. They didn't see it. The song Feliz Navidad, and one of the members of our life group said this is his favorite song, it says, I want, I want to wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. As I mentioned in the bullet, don't we all want our gifts to be received as a gift that comes from our hearts? How many of you get a gift and you hope the person doesn't like it? <laughs> okay, I'm giving this one because I really want to upset them. Yeah, I know it's, never mind, I will not talk about that. I just had but to think about the boxes that are being placed outside right now as some people are coming to the door and stealing boxes, mailed boxes, and there are people who are putting special gifts inside those boxes from their backyard left by their dogs. Thank you. <laughs> I would suggest you don't go try to steal a box from somebody's porch. You never know what you're going to get. But when we give that special gift, we want the person that's receiving it to like it. Now, if we picked it up at the grocery store just before we got there, just because we needed to take something, are we really all that concerned about what it means to them? You've got to give them something, you know, going over to that house again. So, like, you know, what, what do they have? I didn't get anything, you know. I don't know. Maybe they have an old point city. I will buy that, you know. I mean, if you're given a gift like that, is it really that meaningful to you or to that other person? And can you really expect them to say, thank you. That's the best gift I've received this Christmas. And maybe ever. 
we, we, we want to give a gift, hopefully, that means something to a person, that expresses our love to them, that says that they're special. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ. And he gave that gift with the hope that it would touch our hearts and make a difference inside of us and that it would be the best gift ever received. And yet his own did not receive him. And someone said, believers are receivers of the greatest gift ever offered. The gift of a second chance, a new birth, a new life, a new destiny, now and forevermore. How tragic that so many men and women spurn this priceless, gracious gift from God. But just as sad are those who have received this gift and yet choose to live in relative ignorance of their elevated status, instead carelessly compromising with the godless world that has been, that has been conquered by their king. Dearly redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Do you grasp what John is saying? We who are blood-bought and heaven-bound have received the authority from on high to confidently claim the exalted title, Children of God. And if that doesn't make you shout hallelujah, the author says, I don't know what will. Some of you were alive when we sent men to outer space and they walked on the moon. By the way, I just gave you an opportunity to, to react and I, I, you must have all missed it. <laughs> I said something to the effect of it. That doesn't make you shout hallelujah. I don't know what will. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, this, this, this preacher is just a little slow today, I'm sure of it. <laughs> Colonel James Irwin was the astronaut who walked on the moon. And when he talks about his experience there, he, he talks about the, the, the flight there and the weightlessness in space and, and the objects that would float around in the, in the capsule and things like that. Uh, he talked about seeing the, the crescent of the earth rising, <laughs> you know, that's an interesting one, rising from the moon, and, and, the, and then he talked about the celebrative triumphal splashdown that they had, and that was its own miracle, with all the world watching. But, but Irwin also spoke about something that was even more incredible to him. He talked about the impact that the experience had on his spiritual life. He said that as he was walking there on the lunar surface, out there in this you know, giant step for mankind, having this incredible moment that almost none of us will ever experience, although some have seen. He says, as I was out there doing, walking on the earth, he says, I sensed the glory of God. The glory of God and the plight of earthbound man. As he came back to earth, Irwin said he realized he couldn't content himself with being merely a celebrity, which he was. He would have to be a servant, telling his fellow man of a better way to live. Irwin concluded by saying that if we think it a great event to go to the moon, how much greater is the wonder that God came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus. Jesus is God's gift to us every Christmas. And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is that incredible thing that is given to us at Christmas time. There is no other gift that can compare with the gift of Jesus Christ. J.C. Ryle says, the plain meaning of these words is that our divine Savior really took human nature upon him. He did that so he could save sinners. Ryle goes on, he really became a man like ourselves in all things except for sin. 
Like ourselves, he grew from infancy to boyhood and from boyhood to man's estate, both in wisdom and in stature. Like ourselves, he hungered, thirsted, <coughs> ate, drank, slept, was weary, felt pain, wept, rejoiced, marveled, was moved to anger and compassion. Having become flesh and taking a body, he prayed, read the scriptures, suffered being tempted, and submitted his human will to the will of God the Father. And finally, in the same body, he suffered and shed his blood, really died, really rose again, and really ascended into heaven. And yet all this time, he was God, as well as man. The union of two natures in Christ's one person is doubtless one of the greatest mysteries of the Christian religion. It needs to be carefully stated. It is just one of those great truths which are not meant to be curiously pried into, but to be reverently believed. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only Son of God. Wiest translates that this way, and the word entering a new mode of existence became fleshed and lived in a tent, his physical body, among us. And we gazed with attentive and careful regard and spiritual perception at his glory, a glory such as that of a uniquely begotten Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In Young's literal translation, it's translated this way, and the word became flesh and did tabernacle among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as one only begotten of a father full of grace and truth. You see, Jesus is the only son of God. He's one of a kind. There is no other. And here's an unfortunate thing that has come from the Latin Vulgate and some of our other translations of the scripture. There is a word that's been used, and that word is only begotten of the Father. That word Jehovah Witnesses will even use and say, well, see, obviously, he was created, formed by God. He can't be God. He's simply just another special being. But the text here, the word that's actually used, is not begotten. It's one and only. Let me give you a couple of other verses where it says this. In Luke 7, verse 12, it says, As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. The only son, that's the word monogamous, the only, that's the Greek word that's being translated here, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. Luke 8.42, because his only daughter, a girl about 12, was dying as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. His only daughter, Luke 9.38, a man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. I have no other. This is my only child. This is the word that keeps getting translated that unfortunately, in some of our translations, we've called it begotten rather than one and only. There is no other like Jesus Christ because he is one with God. It's John 1, 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the what? The one and only. It's verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but who has? The one and only Son has seen God, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father. He has made him known. Only Jesus is the Son of God. Isn't that what we celebrate from John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his what? His only Son. There is no other. He gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not have perished but have eternal life. And then verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's what? Only Son. It's, first, it's Hebrews 11, verse 7, by faith. Here's one that helps you again understand. This is an only special son. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. 
he who embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Some of you say, yeah, but didn't he have a son to another lady? But that was not the blessed son that God had promised his one and only son, Isaac, who he was about to sacrifice. It's 1 John 4, verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Jesus is the gift of Christmas. And that gift, that gift is an incredible gift. It's full of grace and truth. Ray Pritchard said, grace and truth are two attributes that don't offer, often appear together. We humans tend to err on one side or the other. If we stress grace, we're often too quick to forgive without demanding true repentance. That's the people that enable other people, right? And, and if you've ever had somebody that's an alcoholic in the family, there's somebody in the family who's helping, helping to enable that alcoholic, uh, making excuses for their behavior and forgiving that behavior and doing it too quickly. He says, if we, forgive, if we stress truth, we often sound harsh and, lo and un unloving. You're an alcoholic. Stop it. And we become mean-spirited or sound that way. But the, the fact is, we need both, don't we? We need grace and we need truth. If we forgive too quickly, we make wrong of, we make light of wrongdoing. And if we judge too harshly, we make forgiveness impossible. We need grace and truth. These two words explain why Jesus came to earth. They go to the very heart of the gospel, friends, because Jesus was full of what? Grace. He died for you and me while we were sinners. He gave up his life. He chose to leave heaven and sacrifice himself, but he was also full of truth. He was able to pay for our sins. He forgives the sinner because he bore the sin himself. Here's truly good news for people like us because he is grace full. You can come just as you are. He's easy to approach and, and you don't have to clean yourself up first. In fact, you can't, can you? For a graceful God, you're too dirty to come except you come just as you are and it's because his grace he welcomes you. You'll never get clean on your own. And don't try. Come to Jesus and let him, by his grace, heal you. Who among us has lived such a pure life that no dirt can be found in your past? Front and center. You're the perfect one. The rest of us are all trying to mimic. <laughs> You see, it's just right at this point. None of us is so clean. None of us doesn't have something in our past that we'd rather other people didn't know about. We'd rather there wasn't a record of it, no account made. No matter what sins you've committed, Christ invites you to come just as you are. He has no preconditions except his desire to forgive you. And when you come to Jesus, that's when you are pardoned abundantly. Because he is truthful, you can come in complete confidence that he will keep his promises. When he promises a complete pardon for your sins, he means it. When he says, I forgive you, you are forgiven. When he says, I will forget your sins and remember them no more, he will remember them no more. He is truthful in his promise. He is trustworthy in his word. He is a savior who can be trusted. Fear not, because Jesus is full of truth. Were you imperfect this week? Or am I in a room of only saints? Amen. <laughs> Do you need a forgiving Lord? Then come to him again. He is full of grace. And here's the wonderful thing about Jesus. God gives his gift to anyone who will receive it. Anyone. Unlimited. 
It doesn't matter who they are, what they speak, what language they have, where they come from, how much money they have or don't have, how many things they've done wrong, how terrible they've been, how evil and wrong. It doesn't matter. He gives his grace to those, his gift to those who will receive it. Like it just from what John Piper says, receiving Jesus means that when Jesus offers himself to you, you welcome into your life for what he is. Have you opened your Christmas present again this year? If Jesus comes to you as Savior, welcome his salvation. If Jesus comes to you as leader, welcome his leadership. If he comes to you as a provider, welcome his provision. If he comes to you as a counselor, welcome his counsel. If he comes to you as a protector, welcome his protection. And if he comes to you as authority, welcome his authority. And finally, if he comes to you as king, welcome the king. in trying to explain this word receive the the English standard version bible study bible says received implies not merely intellectual agreement with some facts about Jesus oh yeah it's a wonderful present can you imagine if you did get one of those mercedes this year red bow on the top of it isn't that the way they all come or is it an audi I don't know which one you want. You, know, you pick, take your pick. But one of them sitting there in the driveway. And can you imagine describing that incredible car? Oh, yeah. This is what kind of fuel mileage it gets. This is what kind of warranty it goes with it. This is how fast it goes. This is how it will maneuver. This is all the incredible things that this car can do. And you never drive it. When Jesus comes, receive him. important to know that our behavior does not cause us to get the gift but when we receive the gift our behavior should change our behavior does not save us but it only serves to demonstrate that we truly are saved some twist this verse and say John is speaking only of fellowship or communion and not eternal destiny but such teaching is deceptive and deadly especially if it gives one confidence to live like the devil and think they are still going to heaven just because they prayed a prayer to ask Jesus into their heart. Righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Now I'll come back to that. God gives his gift to those who believe. And speaking about this, Utley says this shows humanity's part in salvation. Humans must respond to God's offer of grace in Christ. This is something that we, we respond to, we react to. We've got to open up the gift, or otherwise the gift remains under the tree. The emphasis throughout the New Testament, isn't it, is to believe. You've got to believe and receive. And when we believe the word, the true light in we, we in turn receive this incredible privilege. What is that? Access to the family of God, to the throne room itself. We get this incredible relation. Romans says it this way. Excuse me. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. We're no longer an enemy through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of glory. Romans 10 says it this way, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth you, that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. By the way, just watch out. 
Some of you have started tuning me out and say, well, I've already done that, so I'm cool. Thank God, I've got the Christmas gift open, and um, I can just move on now, right? In fact, I can just kind of ignore the rest of what Bill has to say this morning. Lord, help. <laughs> Because only those who receive and continue to believe become children of God. First John 3.10 Did you know that we can actually identify who are God's children? First John 3.10 This is how we know who the children of God are. I think that says we can identify it. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Are we children of God? <laughs> John Piper said he gave authority to become children of God. This means that those who reject the light are not the children of God. God is not everybody's father. Everybody's creator, yes, but not everybody's father. Jesus says in John 8, 42, if God were your father, you would love me. And we know that there were many who called God their father, said Abraham was their father, and did not love Jesus. The test of who your father is, is whether you love his son. Oh, how I want you to fix in your minds this question, Piper says. Not everyone is a child of God. Am I? Am I? Ask it to yourself right now. Not everyone is a child of God. Am I? Not is Bill. <laughs> you stay, say that right now to yourself. Everyone is a child of God. Am I? Are you? In John 8, 34 to 36, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not continue in the house, excuse me, the slave does not continue in the house forever. The son continues forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. In other words, we'll not be children. We will be slaves, and the slave does not remain in the house forever. The children do. Cool? What's at stake in becoming a child of God is eternal life. So we ask ourselves that question again. Not everyone is a child of God. Am I? And not everyone will have eternal life. Will I? See, God's revealed himself, hasn't he? He shined a light in the world for all to see. Anyone who wants to can receive that. And it calls for a personal response. You see, to become a Christian means you've got to respond personally to him. You've got to say, Lord, I accept you. Because of what, you're, what you have done for me on the basis of who you are, God, I accept you in my life. Jesus, you died on that cross for me. I accept the payment you paid on that cross. I accept you. There's a response that's necessary as Jesus shines his light. And when you do that, and when we continue to do that, two things continue to happen. First off, when you say yes, you've already become a child of God, haven't you? You've been adopted. Welcomed in. It's one of his children. And secondly, it says that now you're born again. That means God's put his own spiritual DNA in you. He's changed you and made you to become a brand new person. So my question this morning is, are you going to open up your present? In verse 13, he said, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. John Corson said, your grandfather may have been an awesome Christian. Anybody have a grandfather who's really just a wonderful person? 
have a great grandfather, missionary. He almost got excommunicated from the church twice. First, because he tried to set up Sunday school for kids. Oh, wow. Yeah, not bad. I, I'm sorry. I have a rebel for a grandfather, great grandfather. <laughs> And then the second one was even worse. He started up an international missions agency in the Mennonite church to reach the world for Jesus and the bishop wanted to excommunicate him. Yeah, I got, I got some bad blood in my family. I'm sorry. <laughs> what about your grandfather? Just because your grandfather may have done great things for the Lord, does that mean you are therefore a child of God? No, it does not. You can't... Will yourself into becoming a child or a member of the family of God? You accept what Jesus has done for you. There was a poll done recently about who's going to heaven. This is an interesting poll. In the poll, as put out by U.S. News and World Report, they asked 1,000 adults their opinion about who would likely make it into heaven. At the top of that list, to no one's surprise, was a well known religious figure. Who was it? Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Who? <laughs> Several celebrities were also listed, but it was surprising when you found out that 87% of the people listed themselves as believing they, <laughs> that they were going to heaven. 87% of the people in this nation believe that they are going to heaven? On what basis? Because they're born an American? Because of how much they have? Because of the good things they've done? On what basis does someone go to heaven? Someone that was evaluating this says, I can't help but wonder what qualifications for admission into heaven they had in mind. Following an orthodox creed, maybe? They had virtuous character. They gave generously to deserving charities. They followed and or they, they attended church and, and were involved in religious activities. Although these may all be commendable, they miss by eternity the one thing God requires for entrance into heaven. What is it? The one thing that God requires is a com personal commitment of your life to Jesus Christ. Are you headed for heaven? The story is told, I think Harry Ironside is the one who tells the story it's a, of uh, the Tsar of Nicholas I of Russia. The Tsar had a good friend who had a son who needed work. And so the Tsar gave a job to this son, and he had the responsibility to oversee the finances for a barracks of, of soldiers. The challenge was um, this, um, this young man got tempted by the amount of money that he was overseeing. And he started using the money for himself, and he started gambling the money away. And then he got word that the Tsar's own representative was coming the next day to, um, to review his, his documents his books to see about the money that he had. Well, the young man sat down, evaluated it, and looked over the whole books and realized that the debt was so huge there was never going to be any way he could pay it back and cover it right now. And he planned that night to kill himself. He wrote out a confession statement that expressed all the things that he had done in detail. And as he's writing it down, he finished it, he's overwhelmed, and just before midnight he falls asleep at that, little, at that letter. He had a visitor that night, dropped into the barracks and came into the room and saw that the light was on and the, the visitor was the Tsar himself. And the Tsar came up to him and he saw the letter there that it was on the table and he began reading that letter. At the end of the letter, the Tsar wrote, his signed his name. The next morning, the young man woke up, prepared to take his life, and saw the letter and realized somebody had seen it. Now he's even more disturbed. And then he realizes that at the bottom of the letter is the Tsar's signature. He quickly grabs some other documents that he has and tries to see, is it similar or is this a forge? So, you know, who was it that actually saw this, the, this note of confession? And as he compares the signatures, he realizes it was the Tsar's own handwriting. 
And while he's just still trying to figure this all out, there's a knock at the door. And a man comes in with the exact amount that is owed for him to put back in the treasury. Jesus has signed our letter of confession. And he's paid the price that we cannot pay. And it's a gift that he wants to continue to give to us. Have you opened that present this year? And folks, for those of you who said, oh yeah, opened it up 39 years ago. And living my life for Jesus Christ. Then are you sharing that gift with a world that needs to know what Christmas is about? Are you taking the opportunity to tell others about Jesus? Will you go into the world and let people know who Christ is? There was a pastor who was arrested, <laughs> arrested out in front of an abortion clinic supposedly got too close to the door and so he was arrested for, for his um, protest of what the abortion clinic was doing. The prosecutor gave the pastor the choice of accepting a stay away order. Okay, you're just not allowed to be down there. Or send him to jail for two years. Pastor Hoy, Walter Hoy is his name, and this happened in April 2009. Pastor Hoy decided that he would take the jail time. He said he wasn't sorry for his choice. In fact, he sometimes wishes he could have stayed in jail longer. <laughs> I have been a jail chaplain in jail before and even had the privilege of being a guest preacher at San Quentin. Being an inmate is completely different. I was actually one of them and it gave me a different kind of credibility. Jesus came into the world so that the world could know him. Tempted in every way like us, did not sin. Suffered and died and rose from the dead. And it gives him credibility because he came. Because God came into our world. And God's sending us to go back out into that world. And if you want to open up your Christmas present this year, if you've never believed, believe. And if you do believe, then show you believe by giving it away. Lord Jesus, thank you for Christmas. Oh, wow, there's not one of us deserves to be here with you. None of us can earn what you've bought and paid for with us. And God, even for those of us who have received you and, and believed in your name and what you've done for us, we still mess up, God. We still have times where we desperately need forgiveness, where we need you to redirect our focus because we've gotten off track, we've allowed evil to have its place, we've hurt others, we've wronged someone, whatever, Lord. We all have stuff like that, Lord. And we need to open up the present again. The gift of your forgiveness. And live and let that light shine through us once again. And please, Jesus, oh, I pray that none of us here will be one of those who was your own but did not receive you. Yet let us believe and receive this incredible gift once again. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've never committed your life to Christ, I invite you to say yes to him and tell someone else today that you're doing it.